Well, I'd like to welcome you to the new Bricks Jam Room. Um, I have not posted anything for several months, probably six or more months, uh, partially because I've been remodeling my room, so now I'm in a nice, quiet little area of my home. It's all my own. Um, another reason I have not posted anything is for the last several months, I've been writing a book. Uh, what I've tried to do is to stop and organize the things that I know, or at least think that I know, and to put them into a logical order. Um, there's many times that I completely forget that I ever knew something. So I really took a lot of time to stop and drop into the book form all the things that I know, which then spurred other ideas um, and other memories as well. And so then I was able to organize them into um, a, some, some sort of a logical thought process. So I'd like to show that to you here real quick. So I'm calling my book brick by brick by brick and brick is me and uh, it's one man's observations about music theory as it relates to the guitar and wonderful patterns and repeating shapes a visual learners guide I'm a visual learner and uh, so this is really set up for people who are likewise um, I don't read music as a rule I can figure it out kinda like an algebra problem so I've organized this book for the person who is either too lazy or just for some reason or other just as horrible at reading music. And um, so like most books, it's got a table of contents. It's got a little section about me, of course, the author and uh, story and whatnot. Um, the, it, the beginning of the book, there's an awful lot of this kind of thing. So don't let this scare you off if you're at all interested in this. These are the basics that you just got to know to understand some of the upcoming material. So what we talk about, I, I really have dwelled on the major scale on this because that really seems to be the, you know, out of all the lessons that I've done, I keep coming back to the major scale, which really is the beginning of it all, as it says. So I do an awful lot of explaining things that you may already know, but if you don't, if you have, if you're, well, if you're like me, there's a lot of holes in my understanding. So I really tried to fill all the holes. So this is the part that talks about, you know, half steps and whole steps, um, basic intervals, which really is necessary to get going on this. Um, jump into the fretboard and talk a little bit about the construction of the guitar, basic harmony, what a triad is, um, most of you hopefully know that a triad is a one, a three, and a five, you know, or a root, a three and a five. The three is either major or minor, and that's what gives it the quality. So we have minor triads. We've got, so really, quite a bit of basic stuff to get you going. I've got a little section um, that I've developed with some little hand signs that, that help you memorize things and help you figure things out quickly and easily without a piece of paper and without having to just remember it. You've got it on your at, right at your fingertips. But really what, I, what I'll probably demonstrate in this particular showing of my book um, is on the guitar something that's very crucial and to me is the golden key out of everything I've ever learned is intervals, intervals on the guitar. And I know this looks an, like an awful lot going on, but I've got a really great way to introduce you to intervals so that you can memorize them. Because the guitar has a very repeating nature um, with octaves and patterns that just repeat over and over again. So you really only have to know so much. Um, and then after you learn that and burn that into your mind, this, this is basically the language that I'm using as opposed to um, notes on a staff. This is the language that's necessary to go through the book. So I'm going to show you just two things here. Um, the first is going to be a chord. I'm going to play. And I'm not going to tell you what that is just yet, but let's look at it like this. Um, every one of those notes you heard together forming that harmony that made that chord is an interval of some sort or another. So check this out. So for example, the chord that I just played had its root on the fifth string, on the fourth string I played a major third, on the third string I played a major seven, and on the second string I played a major second. And where I played it, I played it on the fifth fret, so D would have been the root. So this chord was a D something. Well it had a major third, which was F sharp, so that means that 
the chord had a major quality. Then I played the major 7, which was a C sharp, which means it's going to give it another quality. And then I also played the major 2nd, which was E. The combination of those four notes turned this into a D major 9. Because it had the 7 and the 2, when you add the 7 and the 2 together is how you get that 9. Now this may look like a lot to try to memorize, but I do have a, a technique in the book that will make it so much simpler. Um, if we take a look right over here at what I'm calling the 145 anchor, the 145 anchor are intervals that are completely fixed in place in relation to each other and in relation to the one or root. So I use the 145 anchor specifically because the fourth of a scale, the four is always considered a perfect fourth. There is no major or minor quality to the four. The same goes for the five. It's called the perfect fifth. There is no major fifth. There is no minor fifth. There is, however, a note in the middle that sometimes you call a flat five or a sharp four. And it has its own name. It's called the tritone. We'll get that to you in just a second. So this pattern, the one, the four, the five, and the one, I call the one, four, five anchor. All of the other intervals are attached to this pattern. So here's that tritone I was talking about, the 1-4-5 anchor, and we're going to be talking mainly with the root on the 6th string, because once you understand that every note has an octave, that you'll be able to find all of your notes, and they spill over onto the 1st and 2nd strings as well. But just to get a pattern embedded in your mind, I wanted to use the root on the 6th string, and then start attaching these other intervals to them. So if you take it into small bites, it will be much easier to memorize. I wanted to add the major third next because thirds are what give a chord its quality, its major or minor sounding quality. When you add the major third to the one, you get a very major sounding harmony happening there. If you uh, remember one of the first chords you ever learned was probably the, the G chord, the natural G chord. Your middle finger was on the one, the root, and your index finger played that major third. That's what gives that G major chord its major sounding quality. So you'll see up here also the relationship to the octave is a little diagonal move there. So this was a good one for me at least to to start off memorizing. When you look at the minor third you'll notice it's just a half step flat of that major third. So once you know where the major third is the minor third is easy enough to find. Same goes for this octave major third. Minor third is right next to it. Knowing where the sevens is very important as well because if if you have learned earlier in the book we talked about triads, a triad is built on a one or root, a third, and a fifth. That makes a basic triad. Once you add the seven, whether it be a major seven or a minor seven, that gives even more flavoring to the chord, as in the example of the one I played just earlier. So here you can see the major seven is just a half step flat of the one or root. Same goes on the sixth string. It's a half step flat of the root. The major seven is the last tone that you hear before a scale repeats up. If you were to do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, the major seven would be the T. In, in that sequence, and then it begins again with the Do, Re, Mi. The minor 7 is again just a half step flat of the major 7. So if you start with the 1, 4, 5 anchor, you add your 3's and your 7's and, and firmly embed those in your mind, then all we have left really is to add the 2 and the 6, and I'll show you that here. To find your 2's, you'll notice that just sharp of the 1 is the minor 2, and just flat of the minor 3 is the major 2. You'll find the same thing um, this minor 3, there's the major 2. So really to find your 2's you already know where your 3's are and you know where your 1's are and so you can start even after you build your mental map you'll start seeing them in relation to your 5's and your 4's as well but for starters just know the 2's are sharp of the 1 and just flat of the 3. 
in the same way are the sixes. The sixes are just flat of the sevens or just sharp of the five. I also like to think, just as I established in my mind, the relationship of the major three to the one, you'll see that the major six to the four is the same diagonal movement. That's just something I do for myself. I always keep in mind the one, four, five anchor, and I attach all of the other intervals to it until it becomes second nature. So here you can see the one, four, five anchor with another one, four, five. All of the intervals are attached. There's the, the major three, the uh, major six. You've got the sevens are just flat of the one, sharp of the six, or the six is flat of the seven. After you establish in your mind some of the basic rules, you'll start uh, knowing this by second nature, and then eventually spill them over onto the first and second strings. So I just wanted to show you that um, before I dissected the, uh, the major scale. So aside from chords, intervals are also what make up a scale or a mode. So for instance, the Ionian mode or the major scale, which is really what we start off, but we really talk a lot about modes in the book as well. But for instance, the major scale is really just a bunch of intervals. <laughs> Let's look at what that looks like. The major scale that I played earlier had its root also was the D. But it, as you recall, it was on the fifth string. So, a little trick I would like to tell you about the major scale, and there are more tricks that go with all the other modes as well, but for instance in the major scale, every major scale is comprised of the root, or the one, the four, or the five, so you have the one, four, five anchor, and all of the other intervals are major. So in this case, the major scale was root, major two, major three, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, and uh, ending on root. So it's the one, four, five anchor, all intervals major. That makes the major scale. The notes of a standardly tuned guitar remain fixed on the fretboard. However, intervals, though they may be fixed in relation to each other, are, it's a movable pattern that moves with the music that you're playing. So the pattern remains intact, but the entire pattern moves. So once the uh, language is grasped, the language of intervals, then we talk about the caged system, um, chord building, uh, triads, recognizing triads within the different chord forms, um, easy ways of building minor chords, seventh chords, diminished chords. Um, we talk a, quite a bit about modes and how um, the chords of a major progression are derived from the different modes. Uh, we talk a little bit about the unique second string tuning of a guitar, that thing that, that can throw off a visual um, recognizability of a pattern, but once you get your mind around how that string is tuned differently than the rest, then the patterns make more sense. Um, talk a little bit about uh, soloing and improvising. So really, like I said, I've got 30 years of knowledge that probably should have been about five, but uh, it took, I took the long road about it. Um, but if, if there's any interest in this, if this looks like something you might want to learn, uh, uh, leave me a, a comment. Um, I have not yet published the book, but I'm moving towards that direction. So, hope you enjoyed.